Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, the Center for Teaching and Learning and Atkins Library have partnered today. Atkins Library is going to be presenting to us on digital humanities as open access resources. We are joined today by Savannah Lake, the Digital Scholarship Coordinator, and Natalie Ornott, the Humanities Librarian. They're going to be talking to us about this important topic. Um, I'd like to ask if you have any questions at all during the presentation today to please put those in the chat. We reserve time for Q&A at the end of the presentation and all questions will be answered. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Savannah and Natalie. All right. Well, thank you so much for the introduction and thanks everyone for being here. I know Natalie and I are really excited about this topic, uh, which is digital humanities as open access resources. Uh, so just for a quick intro, I work at the library as the digital scholarship coordinator, which means I support our digital publishing efforts, which include our open access journals and our open access book publishing, as well as Niner Commons, which is our institutional repository. And I am Natalie Ornat. I'm the Humanities Librarian at Atkins Library. Um, and so I am a subject librarian for a couple of um, academic departments on campus. They work with the English department, religious studies, philosophy and languages and culture studies. Um, and Savannah and I are both on a digital humanities um, uh, group within the library. Uh, we have a lot of colleagues who are very interested in this topic and interested in supporting the campus um, through their interest in, in this practice. So we're excited to come to you all today to chat more about this. Um, and with that, we're gonna also start with a land acknowledgement, which we have on the screen here. And I'm just gonna read this out. So the University of North Carolina Charlotte is located on the traditional territories of the Catawba, Waxa, Chura, Watery, and Sugary peoples. And as many of us are settlers, migrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this land, we are here because this land is colonized. I ask you to join me and us in acknowledging the Catawba, Chira, Sugary, Watery, and Waxa people's community, their elders, both, both past and present, as well as future generations. Great, right, thanks, Natalie. All right, so uh, we thought we would start this conversation about digital humanities being open access resources by uh, talking about what is digital humanities. Uh, so uh, as you may know, this is something of a perennial question since it is a newer and evolving field. There's even a website called whatisdigitalhumanities.com where you can constantly refresh it and see all of the different ways that people have described or kind of defined digital humanities. But uh, throughout those and kind of at its core, what digital humanities projects do is they take computational methods uh, using computers and software and data analysis, and they apply those computational methods to research questions. And these research questions are often within the humanities. They can also be within social sciences. Uh, but because they are using computational methods, uh, in digital projects, what happens is the projects themselves, the products of them are often digital objects. So they're often digital exhibits or websites or data visualizations, interactive experiences or scholarly editions. And these digital projects are often hosted online for free and we all can freely access them. And this is kind of how digital humanities work uh, overlaps with open access scholarship. So as you can see here, you know, open access scholarship, which, you know, takes down traditional publishing barriers so that we can access that scholarship for free. You know, it can include a lot of different type of work, right? So you have some of the more traditional venues, so open access journals, open access book publishing, as well as, you know, some something like open data, where data is freely accessible within a repository, you can download it and do your own work with it. Uh, there are also open educational resources, so textbooks that you can use within your instruction that are freely accessible. And then what we're talking about today, which is digital humanities projects, digital scholarship and research that is freely accessible online. So why use open access materials within your instruction? Uh, well, one study found that 23% of students regularly forego purchasing required textbooks due to their high cost. 
So incorporating open access materials can really help support equity and ensure that all students, regardless of their financial status, are able to engage with the coursework and with the topics at the same level and sort of level that academic uh, playing field. So what I'll start with talking about digital humanities as open access resources is how can we use them as classroom texts? Uh, whereas Natalie will talk about how can we create our own open access scholarship, our own digital humanities projects within the classroom. To start us off, let's think about how we can read these uh, projects, read these texts and use, incorporate them within our own syllabus. Uh, we're gonna go over kind of three different types of digital humanities projects that work well as classroom texts. Uh, the first are enhanced digital editions. And these are essentially digitized versions of texts that you may already be using, but because of their digital format, they have some affordances that the physical edition won't. So they'll be keyword searchable. Some will have structured search where you can really tailor and create some advanced searches and go through an entire corpus in a really advanced way. Uh, and some will also kind of link out to archival material or special questions material related to the text and kind of create Kind of a universe related to that text within one project. So we're going to go over those. We're also going to look at digital libraries and digital archives. And this is when materials from archives or special collections are digitized and made freely available online. And then uh, the last we'll look at are kind of this more like ambiguous DH research projects. You know, as we said at the start of the presentation, uh, DH research and projects can look like a lot of different things. There's not one, you know, size fits all, but the ones we're going to look at in considering using them as classroom texts are kind of these more large scale data driven projects uh, that really are rich with information. And all three of these types of projects can support different learning objectives, different learning outcomes. So when you look at the enhanced digital editions, because there is such robust search functionality because they often bring together different versions of the same text. Uh, these can be really helpful when you're trying to, you know, do projects or work around close reading or comparative analysis. Uh, whereas digital libraries and archives uh, are great opportunities for teaching primary source literacy and just logistically you're giving access to materials, rare materials that are hard to find that are you know, often require reading room and traveling and all those things, you're giving students access to those rare materials for free online. And then finally, uh, DH research projects can be a great way to uh, teach data literacy, how to understand and engage and analyze data and how these people are presenting it, uh, as well as critical analysis of the topics that the projects are on. So we'll start with uh, maybe what some might consider the easiest transition into using this DH projects as classroom texts, and that would be enhanced digital editions, because these most closely resemble texts that people might already be using, right? Uh, so here we can see the Shakespeare Electronic Archive. What they've done is uh, they have different versions of the text right here on the left. Uh, so you can see the Oxford edition, different quartos, uh, and then on the right, they have images from different special questions of original versions of these texts. And they also can't see it in this screenshot, but they also do have a search functionality. So here you could see the potential of using this text. Not only is it free for your students, but also uh, being able to compare different editions and versions uh, could facilitate comparative analysis and close reading. Another one I just wanted to bring your attention because it has such a great search functionality is the Rossetti archive. So this archive uh, collates all of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's uh, textual and pictorial works. Uh, but what they uh, really built out in a cool way is their structured searching. Uh, so I'll show you really quick what this looks like. So you can search you know, by phrase, title, genre, and date. But what I think is really great is, you know, if you have a search, you can limit it to different, you know, ballads or to uh, anthologies, art criticism, 
So you can really, not only do you have access to all of Rossetti's works, but you could really pinpoint related works in a very targeted way, in a way that a physical copy of his works wouldn't allow you to do. So that's some of the, the benefits of using these digital editions uh, within your classroom. All right, so let's move on to digital libraries and digital archives. Uh, you know, as we mentioned, this is when, you know, different materials from special collections or archives are digitized and made available online. What you'll find is that they're structured in a few different ways. Uh, so these ones are structured by topic. So each uh, digital library is all centered around one topic. Uh, so the first, the Digital Library of the Caribbean is a consortial effort. So different institutions and archives and libraries all contributed their content related to the culture and history of the Caribbean. Uh, whereas the second is more of an individually led uh, DH project coming out of, I believe, Penn State University, uh, the Color Conventions Project, which covers uh, Black organizing in the 19th century. So, uh, and I believe the latter project also has curated exhibits where not only do they have this digital library of all these primary source materials, but they've actually created various exhibits using different materials from that archive to kind of go around different topics. So this can be a great way uh, for students to read directly primary sources, explore those. The next kind of digital library you'll see is by format. Uh, so super popular are the newspaper digital libraries. Uh, you know, here is one for North Carolina, but you'll find them a lot uh, by each state. There are a lot of different uh, newspaper digitized newspapers online, which can be great for uh, history and historical projects. And then also this great one here is a uh, digital library maps, uh, which, you know, later when Natalie talks about creating your own digital humanities projects, this can be a great place to go to for uh, getting material for geo-referencing projects. But, you know, in this section, when you want to think about how can I use this as a classroom text, you know, this could be a great way to look at a certain location and see how it's been, it's uh, been portrayed in maps and how that has evolved over time and kind of read those maps as texts. And then finally, uh, this is maybe the most traditional way that you'll find digital libraries online. And this is by institution. So a lot of libraries, museums, universities, they will all have their own digital library online, which features uh, materials from their special collections. So I feature here our very own uh, digital collection, Goldmine, which has materials from special collections held at UNC Charlotte, as well as you know, Library of Congress, their digital collections uh, has a lot of material that can be really helpful for direct reading. So the last kind of category of DH projects that I'll go over are the DH research projects. And uh, this is maybe a little, requires a little more thought than the first two if you want to incorporate it into your instruction as a classroom text, because these don't always resemble texts in the traditional sense that the first two categories do, but they are, you know, very full of information and critical analysis may be used in conjunction with uh, more traditional texts like journal articles or books uh, could really enhance a student's experience of the topic. Uh, so the first is uh, that we're showing is called Mapping Inequality, Redlining in New Deal America. And this is an effort in which uh, primary source material about the uh, government during the New Deal uh, how they would give out and rate neighborhoods for loans and mortgages. Uh, it's digitized essentially those records and mapped them visually onto a map. And it really shows how uh, inequities and racism are baked into the whole housing inequity uh, reality for folks. So you can see here, Kind of the data that they've mapped, but let's say go to Charlotte. So you can see how various neighborhoods were basically graded as to whether or not they should be given loans. And you can see kind of the long-term effects and um, 
especially because a lot of the language within these primary source documents from the government are uh, racist and have a lot of racist language. You can see how this is a systemic issue. And if you go, let's say here, here is the fully transcribed document. If you say show full, you can see the full document as well as the original document itself, the scan. And then the grade itself is mapped onto the whole map. Uh, so, you know, in conjunction with whatever readings that you're going through about redlining, this could be a really powerful tool to see how it actually happened within the US uh, by city and throughout the country. And then the last project I'll show you is this Science at 40. Um, so this is a big topic modeling project about a feminist scholarship within the US. Uh, it took one journal in over since like the mid 70s uh, to I think about 2014. It analyzed all the text and what topics the journal was talking about uh, to see what feminist scholarship or at least feminist this feminist journal was concerned with um, throughout the years. So here you can see the products of the topic modeling. So, you know, biology of sex, that is the topic that the, you know, the algorithm found, and those are the related keywords. Um, but if you want to kind of look at the data visualized, uh, you can see kind of the width of it, the proportion of how much is this journal talking about it um, plotted over time. So a really interesting way to kind of read the data and think about how has feminism you know, been talked about over the past few decades. You can see some anomalies here, like uh, medieval women was talked, a lot, a lot, talked about a lot in the late 80s and then not so much after. And if you click a topic, you can see more details as to, you know, it's uh, over time as well as which articles talked about it in the specific keywords. Uh, so yeah, yeah, as you can see, a lot of opportunity to kind of analyze these works and think about uh, think about the topics and uh, the data itself and data literacy. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Natalie now. Actually, I'll stop the share. Great. Thank you, Savannah. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Um, so we hope that if you um, decide to incorporate some of these digital projects into your syllabus as classroom text for your students to use and explore, um, that you might end up feeling inspired, right? To think about how you together with your class might generate a course-based digital humanities project, or at least contribute to something in development. So that's another option that we're gonna talk about today too. Um, so next, I'm just gonna touch on what this process could look like um, if this was something that you wanted to explore. Um, in your classroom and look at a few examples of what this could look like. Um, but having your students work to actively create or contribute to digital humanities projects is a really exciting opportunity for students to create innovative products that probably really go beyond kind of the norm of academic output that they might be used to. So these really aren't your typical, you know, research papers or presentations that students might expect when attending um, a college level class. So uh, I want to just highlight and start with the four, um, four kind of positives of creating or contributing to DH projects in the classroom and keep these um, in mind in relation to some of our institutional um, student learning outcomes of communication and critical thinking. So the first one I'll highlight on the screen here is student agency. Creating these projects, um, a lot of times from scratch, really allows students to explore lines of inquiry in new ways and drive the creation of essentially new knowledge. So they have uh, a little bit more autonomy and choice in a lot of aspects of the project, especially if you are structuring the assignment so that each student 
um, maybe individually creates their own project um, on you know one common platform, or if you you know open it up even more so that students have their pick of platforms um, in which to uh, you know follow through their line of inquiry for your class. So this is really student-centered learning where students are encouraged to take leadership in the choices that they're making to create effective and really compelling projects. Um, and then with this, of course, comes a greater level of creativity. Um, so these projects allow students to be active creators of online content. Um, and because, you know, as you saw, a lot of the projects that, um, that Savannah was showing us, you know, the digital realm just opens up so many possibilities and forms of creation um, that students have uh, a level of creative license in the project development process that can be really um, empowering and really liberating for students, especially if they're more used to those traditional classroom assignments. Um, and I always like to mention um, that, you know, everyone could be given in, you know, this webinar in a classroom, you know, we could all get the same data set or the same corpus of text, but we'd all create our own unique interpretations of it um, and uh, have visual choices, right, that tell a specific story, right? And so we're all going to come at it with our own level of creativity. Another positive is probably a little bit more obvious, which is the digital skills uh, that's learned through, uh, through going through these projects. So, you know, this is having students take new approaches, using new tools, um, and apply them to your discipline. So, you know, you're applying them to important problems or questions um, within your discipline and, you know, thinking about 21st century ways to look at these issues. Um, and then, of course, too, we have collaboration. So whether students are creating these projects individually or in groups, there's a lot of opportunities for collaboration where students can rely upon one another um, and their diverse set of skills that they might bring to the class um, when contributing to a common project or, you know, if they're using a common tool. So beyond these positives, developing or contributing to these types of projects um, because they are by nature open and accessible, really allows students to, to see the results of their work exist openly and freely in the world. Um, and they could include them on maybe, you know, a future resume or a digital portfolio. Um, and, you know, so students really might be drawn to that because of that kind of greater relevance that these projects can have. Um, and also remember that students are already a lot of times creating online content, um, you know, in their uh, non-academic life. So, you know, these are opportunities that puts this type of work into practice within the academic sphere. Um, so I'm going to talk about two directions that you might take to engage students in creating digital humanities projects. So the first direction is having students create unique projects that exist from start to finish within the scope of the class and semester. Um, and it allows them in a very um, condensed way to kind of experience the academic research and publishing process from, you know, initial start and creation of, you know, the uh, research question, the line of inquiry to, you know, revising, editing and publishing some sort of project online. Um, and ideally, they have a creation to include in some sort of digital portfolio, um, like I mentioned at the uh, just previously. Um, and an alternative option is having students contribute to an existing project, which might be um, some sort of ongoing project, maybe that you have started as a researcher. It might be an ongoing digital project that um, your uh, department or maybe your network of um, research collaborators are working towards, um, or even a crowdsourced project that really relies on um, community participation to develop. So we're going to look at just a couple examples of uh, new digital humanities projects that were created within the span of one semester's course. So um, this first project was developed in an art history class at UNC Chapel Hill, uh, where students created a digital and interactive map of modern architectural sites. Um, and they just used this really, really with the simple technology of Google Maps 
um, and layering on top of Google Maps. So they have different layers here. Um, and so the, the first layer that they mapped was the locations of architectural sites that were highlighted within their course textbook. Um, and when they did this on the map, they saw really the Western focus of that textbook. So then as part of the course, students um, had to find information on specific architects of color and female architects to start to add layers to this map. Um, and they also created a digital timeline with the tool Timeline JS, um, which is a really um, accessible tool that is very low barrier to entry for students and faculty to use um, to kind of showcase this um, within another format. And I'm just going to show you a quick example of another digital map that I like to highlight as well that was created also at UNC Chapel Hill as part of a women's study special topics course um, that looked at the intersection of art and activism. Um, and this project began on just a simple piece of canvas uh, that was laid outside of one of the major libraries there and asked for students to map out the locations where they experienced catcalling incidents. Um, so then students took that canvas and worked with their library um, and their librarians who um, were able to support them with geographic information system software. So you might've heard it called um, GIS software um, and created this online version of a map um, that was also um, for a good time, you could actually add your own experiences directly to this map to describe some incidences. So that's an example of a digital map um, and timeline, but next I want to look at um, a different type of project, which is a digital exhibit. Um, and this one was uh, specifically created with the platform Omeka, which is actually a platform that we um, offer and support at Atkins Library. Um, and this project came out of an anthropology course at Dartmouth College. Um, that was examining the values shaping uh, the practice of medicine. Um, and so in this specific course, uh, it was very timely because they were looking at epidemic disease. And so what students were doing is they were um, spending time uh, with special collections material from uh, Dartmouth College's special collections library. So they were looking at material ranging from the 15th to 21st century, um, and they were also looking at Dartmouth's medical school archives. Um, and these students were grouped together and created their own individual exhibits, uh, focusing on that theme of epidemic disease. Um, so this is a really great project. We're gonna share links um, to, uh, to some of these projects at the end here, but I'm actually just gonna pop this one in the chat if folks wanna take a look at it um, while we're chatting here. Okay, so in both of those examples, students were working um, individually or in groups to contribute to a larger product. Um, and so everyone was really kind of using the same platform, the same tools. Um, so just another approach that you could take, which does give students a little bit more choice and autonomy, um, is having students choose the platform or tools, choose the tool that they would want to use to share their finding. So of course, that's kind of another way that you can structure it as well. Um, so next, the second direction that you could take um, to uh, incorporate uh, digital humanities projects into your classroom is to have students, instead of creating one from scratch, is to have them instead contribute to an existing project. Um, and these could be projects that you know build semester after semester, um, or ones that are ongoing um, uh, that maybe you know about within your network or you know about within your discipline. And one um, kind of selling point, I think, for students on this type of project is that, you know, they really feel like they're contributing to something um, larger that might outlive the class. Um, and it's also a really great great way to give students DH experience without redeveloping an entire assignment or dedicating a lot of class time to it. Um, so 
one kind of uh, activity that could be used as, you know, a homework assignment or um, just, you know, one uh, class period and that has a really low barrier to entry is having students participate in a transcribe-a-thon. Um, and so transcribe-a-thons are events where students transcribe or create digital copies of manuscripts um, or other archival documents. Um, and this is a really great opportunity for students to work really closely with archival material um, and play a role in their preservation. So the digital or the transcribed documents can become a digital corpus of text that could be um, full text searchable. It could be analyzed through distance reading tools or text mining, or it could be included in um, you know, a digitally accessible database. Um, so these are two examples of transcribathons on the screen here you'll see. Um, and the uh, one on the left-hand side is a transcribathon through the Early Modern Recipes Online Collective, which uh, Dr. Jen Monroe from the English department here at UNC Charlotte uh, is, uh, um, has had her classes participate within these transcribathons before. Um, and then the Freedom on the Move transcribathon is um, to help develop a digital da database of resistance stories um, uh, within North American slavery. Um, and another way that students could participate in your class um, to uh, and contribute to an existing project is to have them edit the you know, largest digital open access resource of them all, which uh, is Wikipedia, um, which you know we're all using. Um, and as a librarian, there's no shame. I love Wikipedia um, and I love the pedagogical opportunities uh, uh, that we're gonna kind of talk about here. Um, so Wikipedia actually has a really great set of resources for educators who are looking to incorporate uh, Wikipedia into their instruction. Um, and they have a lot of ideas on how students could contribute. So students, um, they might create their own articles, they might expand existing articles um, by increasing the credibility of sources that are cited on Wikipedia. Um, you might have students in maybe a language class translating articles um, or even creating new media for the site. Um, and through working, with Wikipedia, students are able to practice research skills um, and actively you know, produce and publish information um, and evaluate the existing information that's already on Wikipedia. Um, so there's kind of a lot of check marks that this, that this can do um, when you're having students work within the research process. Um, and I think, you know, particularly for this, it's really exciting for students to see the products of their learning live out in this, you know, really open and incredibly popular resource. Um, and Wikipedia is kind of notorious for having a racial and gender gap in both the wiki editor contributions and the article topics. So if you're interested in having your students work in Wikipedia, um, I definitely recommend checking out the Women in Red project because that can really help you uh, identify specific articles within um, or individuals within your discipline that might need articles um, that you could have students work on. And then the last example that I'll mention is um, having students contribute to uh, an open digital textbook. Um, and students could create chapters or segments of a textbook that can be built upon and um, expanded semester after semester. Um, so this is a book created by Dr. Robin DeRosa and many of her classes uh, that used Pressbooks, which is a word-based software. Um, and kind of similar to contributing to Wikipedia, again, this project allows students to see uh, that they're creating value, adding value to the world, and creating um, a project that's going to be useful after their time in that course. Um, and uh, unlike a lot of other scholarly material, textbooks, you know, if we reflect on them, really are designed to be accessible to students, right? They are... Um, 
uh, pieces of literature that bring new scholars into uh, a discipline or into a subspecialty. So students really are uh, perfect to help create textbooks because they're really keenly attuned to what other students might need to know in order to engage with new material. Um, so this type of project, I will mention, is a little bit easier in disciplines where there's literature or images that are available in the public domain. Okay, so that's really just a small slice of different ways that you might incorporate digital humanities projects and tools into your class. Um, and of course, since we're educators, uh, the excitement that hopefully you're feeling right now with the rush of ideas and possibilities um, might be a bit tempered with your thoughts on how to grade this type of non-traditional content. Um, and so evaluating this type of student work could really be an entire talk. Um, so I'm just going to be really brief here and share some tips coming from a really helpful book. Um, it's called Using Digital Humanities in the Classroom. I'm going to check it back in right after my talk here if anybody wants to put it on hold. Um, we're also um, citing it in our resource list here at the end. Um, but first, something to keep in mind when you're evaluating this type of project um, is to really develop in your grading system um, the valuation of process over product um, and communicate that with students because um, it can really help take away some of the anxiety that students might feel when they're working with new tools and new platforms that they might be unfamiliar with. Um, and it also emphasizes the purpose of the assignment, um, really having them, uh, the purpose really is to reflect on course content, you know, to gain digital skills and think about course content in new ways. Um, many of us are probably already using rubrics, so that would definitely be a, a practice to continue here. Um, and it's really helpful, uh, especially to share these rubrics early in the class, uh, so that as they're creating these projects, they have a, a constant guide to look at as they're developing it. Um, and then it's also helpful to have in-class activities and homework assignments count towards the student's final grades, uh, which uh, showcases to students that, you know, their practice in developing this project and maybe developing elements of it throughout the course um, really, you know, um, is counting towards that, that final grade, that their practice counts and it's tangible for them. Um, and then lastly, having some sort of credit at the end for reflection. So that could be a short paper, a discussion, maybe a one-on-one -on -one interview that you have. Um, so having that some sort of credit again so that students can reflect upon uh, the process that was taken to develop this project. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of really quickly go through some common hesitations that um, you might feel in um, deciding to incorporate digital communities work into your classroom, um, or maybe your colleagues feel or your students feel. Um, so uh, one thing that we might hear is that, uh, you know, that you think you have to redesign an entire course for this, that of course there's no time for this, um, and we definitely understand that. Um, and to that, we would probably just say, you know, think about, uh, the right, choose the right amount of digital humanities that's right for your classroom. Um, so hopefully you saw some ideas here today on ways to kind of start small, um, see how it goes. And if you wanna expand from there, um, uh, there's lots of resources on campus. You have lots of resources and support in the library um, to help you if you want to um, spend more time um, kind of redeveloping your course or redeveloping specific assignments. Um, next, sometimes folks think that they might need computer programming knowledge in order to um, develop some of these really, you know, sophisticated, beautiful projects. Um, and to that, we would just say that, you know, uh, there's a lot of really great tools where you don't need to know any sort of programming language. Um, so tools like WordPress, Timeline JS, you know, Wikipedia have really low, a low barrier to entry to use. Um, but if you are, you know, really uh, 
interested in creating, um, you know, really beautiful, customized, um, advanced project, uh, there's a lot of experts on campus already, right? There's um, other faculty that you might work with, graduate students, maybe um, if you are less familiar with the technology, um, the College of Computing and Informatics might have um, some students who might be interested in helping you build these projects for, um, for course credit. Um, or of course, developing, um, if you have a grant, adding in a line to hire a web developer is also helpful as well. Um, so another common uh, uh, response is that there might not be any room in the syllabus to teach these new skills. Um, and that I think is a really fair one. Uh, a lot of folks' syllabi are really packed, uh, you know, as it is. Um, but we would just maybe say to consider the value that digital humanities could add um, and then weigh that with the amount of content that you would be sacrificing. Um, and just remember that digital humanities allows for students to engage with content um, and course questions in new ways, um, and also ways that could potentially help students really retain this content. Um, and then something that you might hear more so from your students is that they want, you know, I want a normal class, I'm not in CCI, why do I have to learn all this digital stuff? Um, and, you know, we really see this as setting your students up for success by uh, preparing them to be 21st century learners. Um, you know, basic digital literacy is going to be required or is already required for just about every profession. Um, so this gives them really uh, valuable opportunities to add a new digital skill set to their resume. Um, and just a couple things to consider. Uh, the one thing I'm really going to highlight, and then I'm going to just um, send it back over to Savannah, is uh, this first question here of what does it mean to be digital in your discipline and field? Um, so we don't recommend the use of, di or the use of technology just for its own sake. Um, because we want to be integrating a DH component um, or creating DH projects that really help to answer those guiding questions within your discipline. Um, so uh, that's kind of a, a central question to keep in mind. Um, and of course, timing, the resources and technology that you have at your disposal might impact uh, you know, uh, how you choose to uh, integrate this within a class. Um, and then the sustainability and accessibility piece. So thinking about how these projects are gonna live on um, and ways to continue to allow them to be open and freely accessible. Um, so with that, I'm gonna uh, keep sharing the slides and hand it back over to Savannah. Hey, okay, great. Yeah, I mean, kind of going off what Natalie is saying, uh, just some best practice, practices to consider when you are building out these DH projects are, you know, first, when you're thinking of open access publishing, uh, you know, making sure that your project is uh, very clear with reuse and access. So consider uh, attributing a Creative Commons license to your project. So it clearly states how it should be cited when you're part of that open access conversation. Uh, for projects kind of like the uh, textbook that Natalie talked about, uh, but also digital exhibits for any projects in which you're sourcing images that aren't your own, uh, making sure that they're either in the public domain or they also have some sort of Creative Commons license so that you can uh, freely use them. So some you know places that have a lot of these rights cleared images include Wikimedia Commons as well as, well as uh, DPLA. But even in Digital Public Library of America and other kind of digital libraries that I showed examples of early on, uh, most, if not all, will have a rights statement, which clearly states how it can be reused and if you need to contact someone. So uh, just being thoughtful about that when you're doing this sort of online publishing. And then the last would just be preservation planning. Uh, Natalie kind of touched on this when uh, she asked us to think about sustainability. Uh, because these projects are created with software, often, um, you know, you have to think about how will they live on if the software upgrades or migrates or 
no longer have that license or the university no longer has that license, how will it live on? So there are some kind of basic preservation questions going into it that you should consider. And the library has a ton of research resources on this and can help you think through this, but it's definitely something good to do at the start of your project uh, because it can kind of impact uh, your practices within the project and even what platform you end up using. Uh, so uh, there are a number of ways to get more involved uh, with DH on campus. Uh, the first we would say is you can look at uh, the DH Lib Guide that we have posted at Atkins Library. It has a lot of resources, uh, different tools and uh, different journals and books that are relevant. Uh, so definitely check that out if you're interested in learning more. Uh, one really exciting thing we have is this discussion group where various people on campus who have an interest in DH uh, can join. And within the discussion group, we post things like different projects we're working on or different conferences and webinars and learning opportunities that are coming up. So definitely, if you're even just curious, join the group, see what, what's going on on campus surrounding DH. And then finally, uh, I would just say, always feel free to contact us, contact a librarian if you want to learn more, if you want us to have some sort of instruction session within your class, or if you just want to know more about our resources, uh, we included this email at the bottom at kinsdh group at uncc.edu. That will get you to basically anyone, any librarian who is interested in DH. So whatever your question is, it will be sent to the right person. Uh, so definitely feel free to use that. And then lastly, I would just say uh, on Friday, there's another webinar called Bring Technology and Innovation into Your Classroom with Area 49. Uh, this one will be really cool. It's going to be specifically on the different technology spaces and software uh, that the library has that you can use within your own projects and within your instruction. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about that and what Area 49 has to offer, I would definitely recommend that. And that's also a CTL webinar. Uh, so yeah, we just thought we would open it up to questions if anyone had anything to ask. Yeah, I was wondering, um, so what is, what is like the consensus in your experience of um, how students react to um, digital humanities? Like, do they generally like it? Are there some common concerns that they typically have? I think that's a that's a good question, and um, uh, I think that it's it can be mixed, and it depends upon uh, I think the discipline that uh, uh, digital humanities projects might be um, included within. I know from you know disciplines where um, their you know students are used to having more you know uh, traditional assignments of you know papers or you know presentations it can be a little um you know there's a bit of a barrier there uh for you know students to kind of uh look at their, you know, typical line of success, right? If they're seeing that, you know, I'm being successful in these, you know, typical types of assignments um, and then to get a brand new assignment where, you know, they're seeing this, you know, maybe a finished product of, you know, uh, of this digital tool that they're being, you know, tasked with creating at the end of the semester can be intimidating, right? When, especially when you're adding in new technologies. Um, so I think for a lot of students, there's kind of that initial, uh, I guess, intimidation of, you know, how am I going to get from point A to point B, um, since this isn't something uh, that I normally am doing. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, like we mentioned, communicating um, that not only your grading process, right, that, uh, you know, that you're going to be graded on, ideally, the process that you're taking to get to the end product, and the end product does not have to be as beautiful and polished as maybe the example that you're showing um, is really valuable for students and takes away some of that initial anxiety. Um, and then I think, you know, having students know, uh, you know, places of support that they can go, obviously to the professor, but to other, you know, places on campus 
the library, you know, we um, position ourselves as that, you know, extra support piece for students as well, um, helps to kind of take away some of that initial anxiety. Um, so yeah, I would say anxiety, but then also the excitement of, you know, for some students of doing something, doing something different that maybe they're not used to in a class. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. And I feel like um, some of the suggest suggestions about creating and crafting the assignment, even, you know, doing those more low barrier to entry tools can be helpful. So something like Timeline JS, uh, you know, we're also happy to, happy to help with, you know, describing how to use that tool and instruction there. But um, I think that kind of approach can help mitigate some of those fears too. I have a question. Um, so if are there any IRB considerations um, that we need to think about when digitizing content? Like, for instance, um, in one of my assignments, my students um, do a pictorial of a local hero someone that they think is a local hero. And I would love to compile those because they have to be by age. They can choose from age, really from age one to 99. And so I would love to compile those and then have other students fill in the ages that we don't have. And so it's a running project, but do we have to, are there any IRB considerations for publishing that somewhere digitally, if I'm saying that right? Yeah, that's a great question. Natalie, do you have any sense? My sense would um, be no, but I would almost want to talk with our copyright librarian about that. Yeah. Yeah, that would, yeah, I'm thinking what you said, because it was pictorial in nature. So, you know, I would think that there might, having, having a way to get their permissions, um, uh, which of course could be a, or a difficult project, right? If you have kind of a collection from years past, right? In gaining access and having contact information for those folks. Um, but yeah, gaining kind of permission from those individuals, um, you know, for their, you know, their picture to be included on, you know, a digital website, especially one that would be, you know, um, so openly accessible to, um, uh, I would say, that that might be rather than the IRB might be the direction that would be recommended. But uh, but yeah, our copyright librarian, uh, I can put her name in the chat here, um, could be a great resource for that for that question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay, if not, we'll go ahead and we'll wrap up for the day. I know there's another um, really interesting webinar that's about to happen uh, in the library as well. And so we'll go ahead and, and close for now. Um, thank you everyone for coming out today. Um, this has been a great um, presentation. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Savannah, um, for all of this really good information. We are recording this and it will also be on the CTL YouTube channel um, under a playlist that has many resources from Atkins Library on um, open educational resources and open access resources. And so there are other sessions that you may have missed in the past that you can go back and watch. And as uh, Savannah mentioned, there's another session coming up here um, on Friday. Uh, no, yes, Friday at one o'clock that you can register for through the Center for Teaching and Learning on bringing technology uh, to the classroom. And so we hope that we'll see you there as well. Uh, thank you again to everyone and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks.